thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Uh, welcome to our lecture, The Partisan Politics of the Congressional Budget Process. I was learned two things just from the title. One is that we apparently have partisan politics. <laughs> <laughs> that was just to see if you're paying attention. The second is that we apparently have a congressional budget process. Who knew? Right? <laughs> uh, we're very happy to have our colleague with us tonight from Brookings, Molly Reynolds. It's her first visit to us as a Brookings scholar. Like our visiting scholars, she's in the classroom and, and out and about to uh, learn about Las Vegas and the Intermountain West and what we're up to. So we're looking forward to her comments today. Molly has her BA from Smith College and among her many attributes, like yours truly, she's got a graduate degree from the University of Michigan. So we won't hold that against her. We'll let her uh, show us just how important that is. Uh, it's obviously in an election season, this is a uh, particularly relevant topic and we'll look forward to her talk, your questions afterwards, and I'll turn things over to Molly. Great, thanks so much, Bill, um, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming. I'm especially appreciative that you turned out the, the same time as the vice presidential debate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about taxes tonight. They won't be Donald Trump's taxes, but I'll talk a little bit about taxes. Um, and I'll do my best to make a couple of corny dad jokes so that you, uh, you feel like maybe uh, you're watching Tim Kaine and Mike Pence. But again, I, um, I appreciate you all coming out uh, to hear a little bit about uh, my work um, and sort of how we should think more broadly about partisanship in the congressional budget process. And to set the context, let's there we go. I want us to flash back just to last week, so not, not, too, not too long ago. And last week, um, in order to avoid a partial government shutdown, Congress had to adopt at least a short-term spending bill by October 1st. October 1st is the start of the federal government's fiscal year, and Congress was in a place where if they hadn't done anything um, by October 1st, we would have we'd been looking at a partial government shutdown. They managed... Uh, against some of their better efforts to get this done on September 28th, just two, with just two days to spare. But again, this is a short-term spending bill. It only lasts until December 9th. And what really tripped this bill up uh, were uh, disagreements about two issues that pitted Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other. One of these was a question about whether um, funding to address uh, the Zika epidemic should go to the Puerto Rican affiliate of Planned Parenthood, sort of guess which side of this Democrats and Republicans were on. And then the other big issue that was a stumbling block was this question of whether the short-term spending bill should include funds to address uh, leg contamination issues in the water in Flint, Michigan. So this is uh, an example, of, just a very recent example of um, Democrats and Republicans uh, fighting about what to do in the congressional budget process. But this is not by any means the only example. And if we sort of think about um, how we generally hear and understand the budget process, um, we hear a lot of discussion about partisan politics. And so um, these, are, these are some quotes from current members of Congress describing this most recent budget fight. This one from Senator Bill Nelson of Florida, who's obviously uh, uh, someone whose state is really affected by the Zika outbreak, saying this was a serious situation. This is not a time for partisan politics. Uh, Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, blamed the Senate and said uh, they're being blatantly political, too many filibusters, it's all partisanship. Dick Durbin, a uh, member of the Senate from Illinois, said he was tired of these partisan games. Senator Mitch McConnell, um, uh, Senate Majority Leader, uh, laid the partisan blame explicitly on the other party, saying that they were using partisan excuses, but there was no excuse not to pass these short -term spending, this short-term spending bill. And again, these quotes are literally just from the past couple of weeks. If I had gone back in time, I would be able to find lots more, um, lots more like them. And so we think about the, the budget process more broadly. Again, this is often how we think about it. We have Democrats and Republicans on different sides, and they have a really hard time compromising. So this is a political cartoon from uh, December of 2012 that uh, portrays sort of Democrats on one side uh, wanting more money for entitlements, Republicans on the other side uh, wanting tax cuts, and then slowly declining compromise in the middle. 
Uh, another thing about this most recent uh, fight that we saw last week um, that reflects another kind of broader trend in the budget process is the degree to which this seems to happen all of the time, happen over and over again. So this is a cartoon from uh, the beginning of 2013 when Congress managed to um, avoid what uh, came to be known uh, as the fiscal cliff. Uh, you, have, uh, you have Congress getting really excited right here that the fiscal cliff fight is over. And then uh, this, this gentleman here says, don't get too excited. There's a debt ceiling fight coming. So we have the sense that this happens over and over again. Um, and this is uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, headlines from The Onion uh, in, the, in the, case, the class of things that a little, hit a little bit too close to home. So again, from, uh, from 2013, where uh, Obama and Congress must, re must reach a deal on the budget by March 1st, then April 1st, and again, again. And then if you read the fine print, it says, and then twice a week for the next four years. And it really does sort of feel like this sometimes, that we have Democrats and Republicans fighting about what to do about the budget, and they're fighting about it often, and they're only ever sort of finding short-term solutions and punting uh, the question just a little bit down the road. So what I want to talk about tonight is how exactly does party politics shape this budget process? It's really easy to say that we have Democrats and Republicans on different sides fighting about it, but how exactly does that work? Um, and what specifically about that partisan conflict makes it hard for, um, for the congressional budget process to work well and work effectively? So just a kind of brief outline of where we're going tonight. So I'm going to start with a very short overview of the, um, of the federal budget process, just so we have some shared context for, um, for what I'll be talking about. Then I'm going to look at a little bit of data on how the budget process is working. It's a preview. The answer is not well. <laughs> um, and then we're going to dig into this question of how exactly does partisan politics affect the process. We're going to look at sort of two, um, two levels of answer to this question, a sort of direct path from partisan politics and party conflict to the budget process, and then a set of what I'm going to call secondary effects, where we see um, the partisan politics in Congress more broadly um, spilling over into, um, into the budget process in some less expected ways. And then I'm going to end um, with a couple of comments on uh, whether the 2016 elections will matter for, uh, for any of this. So just to, like I said, quickly walk us through the uh, federal budget process. So the federal budget process begins with federal agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, uh, sitting down and deciding uh, how they think uh, money should be spent in the, in the programs that they're responsible for. They develop these, uh, these recommendations, you know, we want to, the Department of Defense wants to spend more on this um, missile program, less on this weapon system, so on and so forth. So each agency develops one of these uh, sets of recommendations, and then they submit uh, the request to the president. And the president takes in this set of recommendations from the agencies, says, you know, I think that these recommendations fit in line with my priorities as the president. I think these, this other set does not. And he uh, puts to, or she puts together um, what's called the president's budget, which again is sort of the president's statement of, um, of his or her priorities for, um, for where money should go uh, in federal programs. And the president sends that up to Congress. When uh, the president and Congress are controlled by the same party, this can be sort of a blueprint from which Congress can work in the budget process. When they're not controlled by the same party, as we see right now, the, federal, uh, the president's budget often sort of just lands with a thud in Congress. Um, that's, for example, what we saw happen this, um, this, uh, this spring. Um, this process, where the president submits his budget to Congress, is supposed to happen by February 15th of each year. So, the, the president's budget goes up, goes up to the Hill, and then the House and the Senate begin by looking at that budget and saying separately in each chamber, all right, what do we think um, federal spending and federal revenues should look like for the coming year? And each chamber puts together what's called a budget resolution, which is a very sort of high level framework um, that lays out the overall size of the pie What's the overall uh, amount of money the federal government's going to spend in the coming year? What's the overall size of the revenue um, that the government's going to bring in? And then from that big pie, 
gets divided up into some general buckets. So we have a bucket for defense, we have a bucket for health, we have a bucket for education, so on and so forth. But that's sort of the level of aggregation that the budget resolution is written at. So the House puts together a budget resolution, the Senate puts together a budget resolution, each chamber is supposed to consider this separately, um, each chamber is supposed to approve one, and then they have to come together um, through what's called a conference committee to compromise and agree on this overall blueprint. Once that happens, the framework gets sent to the appropriations committees in the House and the Senate. Um, and these are the committees whose job it is to actually write the bills that sort of push the money out the door in individual amounts for individual programs. So uh, when the House Appropriations Committee is working on uh, the spending bill for the Department of Defense, it says we're gonna spend this many million dollars on this weapon system and this many million dollars on military readiness when they're working on the uh, uh, bill for the Departments of Labor and Health and Human Services. We're going to spend this much money on Head Start, this much money on Title I for underprivileged schools, so on and so forth. And the appropriations committees are organized into 12 um, subcommittees, and each of these subcommittees is responsible for one of these 12 appropriations bills, which correspond roughly to the different cabinet departments. So again, there's one for defense, there's one for the Departments of Labor and Health and Human Services, one for the Department of the Interior and the EPA, so on and so forth. And so the subcommittees really sort of dig in, get into the weeds, put together a proposal to, uh, for how money should be spent in their jurisdiction. Those go up to the full appropriations committees. Those committees uh, review what the subcommittees have done, vote yes or no on whether to send those 12 individual spending bills to the floor. The House and the Senate vote on separately on uh, the work that their, their chamber's appropriations committees have done. We have to, again, have a conference committee where they come together on a compromise version, and then they get sent up to the president for his signature or veto. So what I'm gonna focus on tonight is these two pieces. So the development of the budget resolution or the kind of high level blueprint for federal spending and revenue, and the appropriations bills, which are the pieces of legislation that contain line items that say how much um, we're going to spend in each fiscal year on sort of individual federal programs. So how has Congress been doing at completing both the budget resolution and these appropriations bills? So first, let's look at how, frequent, how frequently Congress actually manages to pass a budget resolution. So here we see um, what happen, what's happened in the past when um, the same party has controlled both houses of Congress. So we see that when um, Democrats and Republicans, or when Democrats control both houses of Congress, they've managed to produce a budget resolution about 92% of the time. For Repu when uh, both chambers are under Republican control, it's a little less than that, but overall, we're doing okay. This is sort of B, B minus work uh, if, we were, if we were giving them a letter grade. Not surprisingly, when the two chambers are controlled by different parties, um, they've, they've struggled more with this, um, finishing a budget resolution only 64% of the time. And you might note here that when, um, historically, when the divided control of the chambers has given the Senate to Republicans and um, the House to Democrats, we actually have managed to do pretty well at finishing a budget resolution. But all, um, all five of these, um, of these years are at the very beginning of the time span we're looking at here, so in the mid to early 80s. And one thing that I'm gonna argue in a little bit is that some of the structural reasons for dysfunction in the budget process have gotten worse over time. So we, we shouldn't, be too surprised that um, Congress was able to overcome uh, these partisan divides uh, better, a little bit more historically than they are in the very contemporary years. So budget resolution, we're doing okay, not great, uh, but not, uh, not the worst indicator in the world. What about developing appropriations bills? So this is the question of when the House and the Senate Appropriations Committees really go to work on um, their individual uh, proposals, do they, actually, um, do they actually get that part of the process done? And this, um, this greenish line 
uh, is the House. Um, this dark blue line is the Senate. And this graph takes us from 2007, uh, fiscal year 2007, which is the first one under um, Democratic control uh, after the 2006 elections during the end of the Bush administration through um, 2016, which is um, the fiscal year that just ended. And the reason this is an important metric is because two things. One, we there's really important work that happens when the appropriations committees dig into these spending bills. It's a really important um, venue for congressional oversight. So if you're the um, House Appropriations Subcommittee on the Department of Defense, and you want to figure out whether a new, uh, a new weapon system is really cost effective, whether um, the military is doing what it's supposed to be doing, um, what better way than to haul the person in charge of uh, that process up before your committee uh, when you're trying to decide how much money to spend on it and ask them a lot of questions. So it's important because um, there's uh, important deliberative work that's done when committees work on these bills. It's also important because it can be a signal for how the members who actually sit on the Appropriations Committee think the process is going to go. So if you're a member of Congress, you've got a lot of demands on your time, and if you don't actually think that Congress is going to finish the appropriations process, you have much less of an incentive to do all the really hard work in putting together an appropriations bill if you think that it's going to go nowhere. So again, this, the Senate, we can see, has done pretty well. So uh, 12 is the number of appropriations bills we're shooting for every year. Um, and since, 2000, since fiscal year 2007, Senate's, uh, there have been some years when they haven't finished them all, but they've finished them all the past two years, and they've, they've done okay. The House has varied a little bit more. Um, in uh, fiscal year 2010, uh, they, uh, they, they, did, they did not do particularly well. Um, so, uh, but again, this isn't the worst indicator, but it, it could be better. What about actually passing these appropriations bills? And here is where we really start to see an indicator of some of this dysfunction. And so um, the green line here uh, is how many uh, standalone appropriations bills does Congress actu has ac Congress actually enacted in each of these years? Um, and again, what we're shooting for here is, uh, is 12. We're shooting for uh, Congress to actually, um, so I will say that, um, You'll really eagle-eyed uh, uh, viewers will note that uh, uh, there was a period of time when we were shooting for 13. Now we're down to 12, and that's why this uh, this line is a little bit higher here. Um, but so we're shooting for for 12 or 13, depending on the year. Um, and again, this is what we want to see. We want to see Congress working on separate appropriations bills, um, making decisions about uh, how to spend uh, money in different areas of the federal government, devoting floor time to really having these debates. So uh, the solid green line has fluctuated over time, but if you can see this sort of dotted line here uh, is a linear trend in the solid line, and that's fallen considerably um, over time. And for instance, this fiscal year, we met, uh, Congress managed to finish just one um, uh, separate spending bill so far. And then this, dot, this sort of blue dotted line is how many of these separate bills did they finish on time, which is by um, October 1st. And we can see again that that has, um, that has really, really gotten uh, uh, bad in the past um, decade or so to the point where there's, uh, there were several years um, before this one where Congress actually uh, managed to complete none of the separate appropriations bills on time. So lastly, the last metric I want us to look at is this question of how long do we spend under what are called continuing resolutions? And these are these short-term spending bills, like the one that Congress um, passed last week. And we call them continuing resolutions because they take the amount of money that Congress was spending last year and they just continue that on um, into the next year. And continuing resolutions, um, uh, are suboptimal for a couple of reasons. One is that they're really bad for the agencies that have to operate under them. They give agencies a lot of uncertainty. So if you're a federal agency um, and you are operating under continuing resolution, you don't really know, I mean, you know how long that one is going to last, but you don't know whether it's gonna be followed by another continuing resolution, whether it's gonna be followed by a full appropriations bill, it's followed by a full appropriations bill, um, 
will that bill have more money? You don't know. So it's really hard for you to plan um, and, make, um, and make decisions. Um, so we've seen this. So this graph goes back to 1998. We saw, uh, and this is the number, of, um, the number of days on the y axis. And so um, we see here that for a while, Congress um, was using uh, uh, continuing resolutions frequently, but they were, they were sort of shorter in duration. And then between 2007 and 2013, we actually had several years where basically the whole year was spent under a short-term spending bill that just kind of continued funding from the previous year, uh, which again is, is bad for agencies. So this, like the last graph, again, is not terribly promising for Congress. So verdict here, Congress regularly struggles to complete um, various parts of the budget process on time. Is party conflict to blame? I'm going to argue yes, it is. And we're going to look specifically at three ways that party conflict can derail the budget process. The first is when there are intra-party divisions. So when, particularly within the majority party, when there's disagreement within the party. We're going to look at inter-party divisions, uh, when the two parties disagree with one another. And then we're going to look at interbranch divisions, which is basically when Congress and the president disagree about what should happen. And in this part of the talk, I'm going to be relying on some uh, work from two sets of political scientists, um, one uh, John Moon and Sarah Anderson, and then another named Peter Hansen. So what do I mean by intra-party divisions? So here again, I mean divisions within the majority party. So currently, both chambers of Congress are controlled by Republicans, and so uh, this would, uh, when in the current Congress, this would mean uh, divisions within the Republican Party. And a really great example of how this has played out recently actually comes from this year's um, budget resolution in the House. Um, the House failed to complete action on a budget resolution this year. And that is in part because within the Republican Party, there was disagreement about how big the overall pie should be in the budget resolution. So remember, the budget resolution sets that overall pie, and then it divides that pie up into buckets. And there were some members of the Republican Party, um, led by Speaker of the House Paul Ryan and other members of the Republican leadership who wanted to have the pie be one size. And then there was another set of members um, led principally by members of the House Freedom Caucus who wanted that pie to be a little bit smaller. And Paul Ryan looked at that conflict and says, you know what, uh, I don't have enough members in my uh, part of the majority party to get um, a majority on the floor for a budget resolution, so I'm just not going to do it at all. So um, one sort of indicator of how this, has, um, how this has gotten worse over time, which contributes to um, uh, the worsening of the budget process over time is this data, um, again, from John Moon and Sarah Anderson that talks about um, intraparty conflict in terms of divisions between the Appropriations Committee and the majority party uh, in the chamber as a whole, particularly in the House, which is what we see here. And the idea here is that if the Appropriations Committee in the House, even the majority party members, want one set of spending priorities, if the whole majority party doesn't agree with them, um, they're going to have a hard time getting uh, that, that bill that the Appropriations Committee puts together through the full House. Um, and so this, this is important because this means that even when, um, you're in the, when your party is in the majority, if you have enough disagreement within your party, it's going uh, to cause problems for the budget process as well. And so, um, what, uh, what we and Anderson argue is that when you have this distance between majority party appropriators and the majority party as a whole, the budget, the appropriations process takes longer to complete, uh, which is one of, the, um, one of the indicators we looked at before. And you can see that this has sort of increased steadily over time. What about inter-party conflict? So this is sort of what we, uh, what we often think about when we talk about polarization in Congress. And that's that there are big divisions between the parties. So you may, as I have displayed here, have some disagreement within the majority party, um, the Republicans. But more importantly, you have a bigger distance between the Republicans on this side and the Democrats on this side. And this is important because when you have this distance, it's harder to build compromise. Um, 
it's harder to get uh, some members of the minority party to go along with the majority party, which is especially important in the Senate, thanks to the Senate filibuster. So in the Senate, uh, you need 60 votes uh, to end debate uh, in most circumstances. And so in order to, um, if you're the majority party, often you still need some members of the minority party to go along with you. And when this distance is greater, that compromise, that coalition is harder to build. So we're gonna look at two indicators of this increasing inter-party conflict, which has corresponded to more dysfunction in the budget process. And the first um, is this idea that the size of the Senate's majority party has um, trended downward over time. So we see smaller Senate majorities now than we used to. So right now, for example, uh, Republicans have a 54 seat majority in the Senate and there are 46 Democrats. Um, and so that is here. But you can see that going back to the early 70s, um, which is when the modern congressional budget process started, um, we, uh, occasionally had much larger Senate majorities. And so what, uh, what Hansen finds is that as um, the size of the Senate majority party gets smaller, as the Senate majority party has to rely more on members of the minority party to get things done, we see more um, of these omnibus, what we call omnibus appropriations bills, which is where Congress ends up taking those 12 separate bills they were supposed to do and folding them together into one big bill. We see more omnibus bills. And the idea here is pretty simple. If you're the majority party and it's gonna be hard for you to build a coalition, it, it's really attractive to have to do it just one time on one big giant spending bill than to have to try and do it 12 separate times. Um, another sort of um, finding that comes out of this work is that we see more of these big omnibus bills uh, in the Senate when the Senate is more polarized. And so that's the idea that Republicans and Democrats are farther apart from each other than they used to be. And again, we've seen this increase pretty consistently over time, going back to the, um, from, from the 70s um, until today. So we talked about inter-party, we talked about intra-party, inter-party conflict. What about interbranch conflict? So this is the idea that you have Congress over here, the president over here, and again, it's the same logic. When there's, when there's ideological distance between the two branches, it's harder to build compromise, and thus either takes, it takes the process longer to finish, or it's more attractive to do one giant spending bill <coughs> to negotiate just one big agreement between Congress and the president, as opposed to having to do it 12 separate times, and it's harder to get it done on time. So here, if we return to um, this work from Woon and Anderson, that says that we see more delay in the process when Congress and the president, <coughs> excuse me, are ideologically different. And so this dark blue line indicates um, ideological difference between Congress and the president. These shaded areas are um, correspond to periods of divided government. There should also be a little uh, stripe of divided government right here in the 110th Congress. Um, and then the green line goes back to that um, graph I showed you of the number of days spent under a short-term continuing resolution. And so we can see here that often, um, particularly in more recent years, uh, when uh, uh, Congress and the president are more different from one another, um, we spend, um, we spend uh, more days under, uh, under a continuing resolution. So we've talked about some sort of direct um, uh, uh, peer, uh, uh, kind of direct path from um, party conflict to dysfunction in the budget process. Now we're going to talk about some sort of secondary effects. Um, and this is some work that I've been doing recently, um, and so I'm excited to tell you all about it. So the idea here is that the budget process has also become sort of a steam valve for party conflict in the legislative process more broadly. And so the inter and intra-party uh, divisions that we've talked about affect other parts of the legislative process too. The budget process doesn't occup um, uh, operate in a vacuum. And in other parts of the legislative process, party leaders respond to this conflict by trying to manage the process really tightly to ensure um, that their, uh, 
their preferred outcomes um, are the ones that are produced. And an important part of this is restricting the opportunities of individual House members and senators to offer amendments um, to bills. And the idea here is that uh, if you're the majority party and you are trying to manage the process and you are worried um, that a member of the minority party might come to the floor and offer a really controversial amendment that's going to embarrass some of, some of your members, um, you, uh, you're going to want to restrict the ability of the minority party to do that. Importantly, leaders are less able to do this as part of the budget process, in part because of the, the particular rules that the budget process operates under. And we can talk more about that in Q&A if you like. And so this is summed up really well in this um, quote that I have up behind me from former Senate parliamentarian Bob Dove. And he says that, uh, he describes this as like a steam kettle. So you fire it up, uh, sort of partisanship in the process, and it's going to come out somewhere. And if senators can not offer amendments freely to other measures, they're not going to turn to the budget process to do so. But as long as the budget process stands almost alone as a way for members of the minority party to get votes on the things that they want, uh, that process is going to be targeted. So we're going to see this um, in both the House and the Senate. Um, and just an example um, comes, from, uh, the, uh, comes from the House appropriations process in 2015. So this is sort of what it means uh, to, to use the steam valve. So in July of 2015, the House is, deba is debating uh, the spending bill for the EPA and the Department of the Interior. And this is just after, um, you may remember, a, um, uh, uh, the shooting at a, a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, of a number of uh, parishioners. And in the aftermath of that, the South Carolina legislature chose to take down the Confederate flag from the Capitol grounds. So some Democrats, sort of sensing that this was a salient political issue, offered an amendment to this appropriations bill um, that would limit the display of confeder the Confederate flag on federal lands. Uh, this amendment is adopted. Um, it's approved in the course of debate. Republicans respond with an amendment of their own that would basically undo the Democrats' efforts. And so this leaves then Speaker of the House John Boehner with a, with a tricky situation. Does he let this vote on this Republican amendment go forward? Um, it would potentially expose some both divisions within his party and uh, sort of show the world that there were members of the Republican Party who were willing to vote for this amendment. Um, this was, a, again, a politically tricky situation for him. And what he chooses to do is instead of hold a vote on this contentious issue, he pulls the appropriations bill from the floor. And this actually marks basically the end of the regular consideration of appropriations bills um, in the House in 2015. Um, Boehner is significantly worried that future, that Democrats will try to offer similar amendments to future appropriations bills, and he doesn't want to have to deal with resolving that dispute within his caucus. Um, and then we sort of end up, as we have um, a number of times recently, with a, a, a big omnibus bill that folds those 12 separate bills together um, last December. So to look at some data on this, so this uh, graph reflects the overall decline in the, um, in the opportunities for members of the House to offer whatever amendments they want to bills. And so um, this goes back to the 103rd Congress, which is in the early 90s. And the y-axis here is um, the uh, share of all bills except for appropriations bills that are considered under the House under open amendment processes. And so we can see that um, this used to be in sort of the 40 to 60 percent range, and then has dropped off precipitously over time to the point where um, in the 111th Congress, there were actually no bills other than appropriations bills that were committed that were considered under um, this kind of um, open amending process that allowed individual rank and file members to offer what they wanted. So, not surprisingly, um, over what's basically uh, the second half of this graph, um, so going back to 2004, we've seen a corresponding rise in the number of um, amendments that House members want to offer on appropriations bills. So this has risen pretty quickly over time. Uh, this spike up in 2010 um, has a lot to do with a Defense Department appropriations bill that included something like 500 um, proposed amendments by now Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona. Um, if I were to take that outlier out, it would be a more of a smooth curve. Um, but anyway, so what we see here is that 
members of the house are responding to, um, so party leaders are uh, um, limiting amendment opportunities in other parts of the legislative process because they're concerned about party conflict on those bills. Um, and then members still wanting to be able to offer amendments are turning to the place where party leaders haven't limited, uh, limited their chances, and that's, that's the appropriations process. And we worry about this increase um, for two reasons. One, um, because in the, like in the case of the Confederate Flag Amendment, when some of these, um, these increasing number of amendments are, um, are really controversial, it can lead party leaders just want to abandon the regular budget process altogether. In addition, this can just take a really long time to finish. So this is, um, this is the average number um, per uh, appropriations bill. But again, you know, I was saying in, in 2010, Jeff Flake wanted to offer 500 plus amendments to just one bill. And that, that takes a lot of time for Congress to get through. Um, and we know that uh, Congress in recent years has been less and less want to stay in Washington. Um, they've taken long recesses. And so the more amendments there are to the appropriations bills, the longer the process takes to get through. So in the Senate, um, we see a similar dynamic on the budget resolution. So this dark blue line and then the corresponding linear trend line indicate uh, the overall trend in amendments uh, in the Senate. And so this is um, on this y-axis. Um, of all of the amendments, the senators indicate that they want to offer uh, to all bills in the on the Senate floor, what percentage of those amendments actually, that were they actually allowed to offer? Did the majority party actually um, uh, permit? And so that's fallen over time. And then uh, at the same time, we've seen a, a steady increase in the number of amendments um, on the budget resolution. So again, and this goes back to that quote that I read you from the Senate parliamentarian, when senators are losing their ability to um, offer amendments elsewhere, they turn to the place where they're still, or they still have unlimited amendment opportunities. Uh, and that's the budget resolution, and that makes that process take longer and be more prone to, uh, to controversial amendments. So I'm just gonna um, wrap up quickly, and then I'm gonna leave some time for questions with this question of will the 2016 election matter? So, um, on the upside, um, there is some interest in both chambers of Congress right now, both the House and the Senate, in budget process reform. Um, relatively little of it is directed at these procedural components that I was talking about, this business with amendments. Um, the biggest idea that uh, there's some enthusiasm in Congress about right now is something called biennial budgeting, which would basically take that, um, in sort of the, the most common formulation, would take that budget resolution, the big picture framework, and instead of doing it every year, Congress would do it every other year. The argument here is, you know, Congress has gotten pretty bad at finishing it each year. If they only had to do it once every two years, great, less work. Um, the, the downside is that uh, if we think that the reason that Congress doesn't want to finish the budget resolution is these, these structural factors, are those really going to go away when it has to do it only every other year? Uh, the stakes of not finishing it, if they only have to do it every other, two, every other year, are a little bit higher. So we'll see. But like I said, there's some interest in both chambers right now. We'll see where that goes. In terms of thinking about the outcome of the 2016 elections, um, there's a distinct possibility that the 2016 elections will bring a smaller House Republican majority than we have right now. Um, the Democrats are, um, are not at all expected to retake control of the House, um, but it is possible that they will pick up um, some seats, different forecasts put this at different numbers, but um, the, uh, it's somewhat likely that uh, the House Republicans will still be in control, but will have a smaller majority. What does this mean for the budget process? So if you think back to when I was talking about um, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan having to manage these differences within his party, um, if the party is, sm is smaller, but still has these differences between different factions, that gives him less room for error, 
and it makes it more likely that he may have to turn to, um, to Democratic votes to get some components of the budget process done, particularly big omnibus appropriations bills, which many members of the House Republican Party oppose on sort of principled grounds because they believe that when Congress turns to one big spending bill like that, um, it frequently uh, shortchanges conservative um, spending priorities, which uh, in often involve cutting uh, federal programs. So if there is a smaller House Republican majority, that could make it more challenging to get some components of, um, of the budget process done. It's also a possibility of a very closely divided Senate. So regardless of whether um, Republicans maintain their majority in the Senate or Democrats retake control of the Senate, um, it's expected that, that uh, the either, um, either party would have a smaller uh, majority than uh, Republicans have right now. Uh, and so this means if we think back to the challenges uh, um, about, when we talked about the um, the effect of smaller Senate majorities on uh, increased likelihood of omnibus, omnibus appropriations bills. I think again, we're likely to see that play out, um, play out in the in the next Senate. Uh, and again, that requires the majority party, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, to get some members of um, of the other party on board with their plans for the appropriations process, because neither party is expected to get those 60 votes that they need to to limit debate. Which brings me to my, my last and um, my last point here, which is that uh, even if we are to see unified government, which would um, take the form of Republican control of the House and the Senate and an election of Donald Trump to the White House, that wouldn't be a panacea for the budget process. And again, this is, has to do with the existence of the, the filibuster in the Senate. Um, even if Republicans maintain control of the Senate, um, it's they are, uh, they are not expected to have the 60 vote majority that would allow them to end debate without any cooperation from Democrats. And so um, I think that we would, we would, they would still need to, to build compromise um, with, uh, with Democrats to get uh, the budget process done. Um, and Democrats in turn, um, particularly in a situation of unified government, would have a sort of increased incentive to uh, to really hold out for um, the best deal that they could. So that's not a terribly uplifting place to end my comments, um, but I'll stop there and I would love to take your questions. We have time for a few questions. If anyone has more comments, if anyone wants to get us started. Yes. I just, um, looking at your graphs and stuff, I was curious as to um, the first and second term, if you saw a big swing that way, you know, with the, with the president, you know, whether they're in the first term or the second term. If that's and I haven't looked at that, but that's a really great question. Um, and we do, uh, there are, uh, we do think that sometimes there can be different legis different dynamics between the legislature and the president in first terms versus well, second terms. The second term, you're not going to have the power they would have on, yeah, know. and so um, um, I haven't looked at that specifically uh, to see if um, to see uh, what uh, implications that has for the budget process. Um, specifically, one thing I will say is that we usually see um, the president's party lose seats in midterm elections, and so to the extent that so if the president comes in, particularly a new president comes into power, he has um, some coattails that bring in more members of his own uh, his own party. Uh, the interbranch division that I talked about is helping to produce some dysfunction in the budget process, maybe less present at the beginning of the term when he has more uh, members of his own party in Congress. And then after the midterms, when uh, the president's party often experiences losses in Congress, um, that, may, that may increase the dysfunction. Um, but again, I haven't looked at that um, specifically, but that'll be a great, that's a great um, suggestion, a great thing to look at in the future. Yes? Does the Okay. Yes. Does the tone of the uh, Congress kind of change depending on the party of the president? So have you seen that like Republican presidents tend to have a better time, you know, passing things than Democratic presidents? Um, so that that's a that's also a great question. Um, one of the things that's uh, that's a little tricky about um, looking at things like that is that um, we've seen a sort of increase in uh, polarization over the past thirty years, um, and so we're at sort of the, the peak of that now. Um, 
but uh, we only have so many precedents to look at. So we have sort of eight years of, um, of Barack Obama in the White House with increasing polarization. We had eight years of George W. Bush with increasing polarization. And I think as we go further into the future, we'll get a better, um, more data that we, that we can look at, um, look at on that front. Um, one thing that is, um, is interesting to think about in the budget process is what kinds of priorities do Republicans presidents versus Democratic presidents generally have. And so we know that um, there are certain federal programs that Democrats frequently want to spend more on, and there are certain things Republicans um, frequently want to spend more on. And so, um, so that can also give us a sense of sort of what, uh, what, the, um, what the, the tone is like, particularly because Democrats are generally in favor of more spending than Republicans are, and Republicans are often in favor of more tax cuts. Oh, great. Question, maybe. Uh, talking about elections, of course, and uh, here in Nevada, we have a, a Senate seat yes. up for election. And it's a very competitive one. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I guess my, my question is, while we have a presidential election yes. in this cycle, uh, there's a lot of talk and a lot of money being poured mm -hmm. into Senate elections yes. to keep control of the Senate. Some of what you said would argue that that's not as important as we might think it is. Right, so um, I mean, part of the reason why you see, uh, I think, so much money coming into the Nevada Senate race this year is because it's the only Senate race in the country where um, it's a seat that's currently held by a Democrat that uh, Democrats think that they might lose this cycle. And so um, as Democrats are trying to, um, to regain control um, of the Senate, uh, it's a sort of really important important piece to that. Um, so I think that in the in the budget process, I would argue that um, building building compromise is challenging, um, regardless regardless of which uh, which party is in control of the Senate, and um, it will require some sort of bridge building across the aisle. Um, at the same time, I would say that uh, in the legislative process more broadly, it matters quite a bit um, which party is in control of the Senate, in part because the party that's in control of the Senate is the one who gets to decide what the Senate works on. Um, the Senate majority leader has um, certain scheduling powers. He gets to set the agenda of what gets uh, considered on the Senate floor. So. We know that every year Congress is going to work on the budget process. It's one of its most fundamental responsibilities. And even if it has trouble finishing it, um, it we know every year they're, they're going to work on it. But there are lots of other things that Congress could or could not be working on. And so there are really, a, really important um, agenda choices that, uh, that the different parties uh, will make different choices about. So in that sense, I would say it matters a great deal. Um, in the context of the budget process, um, it also certainly matters in terms of like uh, both the size of the overall pie. Um, Democrats often want a bigger pie, Republicans want a slightly smaller pie, um, and exactly how that pie is distributed will vary across the parties. But at the end of the day, you're right, um, regardless of which party is in control, um, they're gonna have to cooperate some with, uh, with members of the other party. Maybe we should leave on that optimistic note. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you got me back. Uh, got me back to some optimism from the pessimism where I ended my lecture. So, thank you for thank navigating you. us through this process. Thank you all for coming out. Speaking of elections, uh, we have one coming up. And <laughs> we won't be back with another Brookings lecture until after the election, uh, since there's so many other things going on, including a debate on campus. You may have heard of <laughs> uh, in passing. So if, uh, we'll be back on November 15th with a talk from a, a visiting Brookings colleague uh, on the clean tech economy, something that's been in the news quite a bit here in Nevada lately regarding solar energy and the Public Utilities Commission. So uh, if you can join us then, we'd love to see you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.